weekly look at all of the hot topics in HR. Whether it's passive talent or it's active talent. That's a soft skill that really gets undersold in the hiring process. How to manage in the virtual environment. You get a diverse cultured group of people. It's a win-win for everybody. More conversion from candidate leads. What does that look like in this new virtual world? Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Talent Experience Live. It is Thursday, noon Eastern time, and you know what that means. It is your weekly look into the hot topics in HR, talent acquisition, as well as talent management. I am your host, Devin Foster, and we are covering today uh, an interview with a leader in the industry, as well as we'll talk a little bit of HR tech here and there, but very excited. Uh, as always, if you are new to the program, sharing is caring, so please feel free to share this out to your network, as well as jump in the comment section. I see a couple comments already streaming up. It says, uh, ben Eubanks, who is live behind the scenes right now, says, here we go. John Ryle says, looking forward to this. Welcome, everyone. Uh, just a friendly reminder that if you are not able to catch the full episode, you can always watch it on YouTube. It goes live immediately after the program. We also have it, obviously, streaming on LinkedIn. Uh, after that, we always do a nice little blog recap with snippets, uh, as well as a write-up that you can share with your friends, family, and loved ones. I know that I have a newsletter that I share out to my family every single week. They can't wait for it. They say when it's Friday at 4 p.m., they say, Devin, where is the newsletter with Talent Experience Live from last week? I'm just kidding, but definitely check that out on our blog as well as all of our other fantastic content. Today, a uh, very special guest as well as topic. It is a candid conversation with Ben Eubanks. And I know that the title says we are talking about employee experience, but if you have any questions about talent acquisition, about talent management, or anything in between, feel free to hop into the comment section and ask Ben. That is the beauty of doing things live is that we can interact with the audience in real time. But Back to the employee experience topic that we kind of shaped this episode around. Uh, employers are facing this looming threat of the great resignation. Uh, you can't hop on to an HR web page or anything in between without this idea of the tsunami turnover. And employers are really all systems go on trying to resolve this and retain top talent between ramping up initiatives to support employee in de uh, development, a career pathing, DE&I, gigs, and more. The question really is, is it all actually working? And if some aren't, what aren't those that are working and what is working? So we are going to chat with Ben about that today. But of course, it is tradition to always do an icebreaker. Uh, and this is one of my favorite parts of the show, aside from the main content. So today's icebreaker question for the audience is, if you are watching the Olympics or even just highlights on YouTube, like I was earlier this morning, what is your favorite event to watch? So let me know. I love to hear it. Uh, every four years is always an exciting time we get to watch some sports that we may typically not. I know I watched uh, some diving earlier today. Uh, the young lady from China who scored perfect tens was awesome. Ping pong is always exciting, especially when I see all of these company culture videos with ping pong tables and you know people having fun hitting it back and forth. Then you watch it as an Olympic sport and you're like, even the guy who is the best in the office will not hold a candle to some of this. Uh, I see Jen chimes in the comments section, so she loves watching gymnastics. It is also exciting to see that. Hopefully no one gets the twisties out there because that sounds absolutely awful. Um, but back to the topic of ham. Mark says swimming. Uh, of course, this is not an Olympic show. This is all around human resources. And today we're talking uh, a little bit about employee experience with Ben Eubanks. So without any further hesitation, let's welcome Ben onto the show. Ben, how are you? Hey, Devin. I'm so glad to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Oh, so I am excited about it as well. Uh, ben, I see people are pouring in with what sports they're watching. Dan says race watching. Caitlin says she loves gymnastics as well as synchronized swimming. I have to ask you, Olympics come once every four years, sometimes five. Uh, is there a sport that you 
try and tune in and, and catch when the Olympics are on. Yes, absolutely. So there's, and there's, there's so many fun things that we don't actually see in our daily, daily lives. Or you're, you're never going to catch us a, a, a ping pong game on the TV, like normally. So that's kind of fun. The thing that I love to see though, is actually wrestling. Um, I was a wrestler in high school. That was my favorite sport out of all the ones I did. I'm secretly hoping that my, my six year old son will get interested in it at some point And I can kind of encourage him that way. So I love watching wrestling and seeing these world-class people go at it. Like, you know, just wear each other out. It's so much oh. fun. Um, I'm a, like an individual sport kind of person instead of mm -hmm. the team sports kind of stuff. And so that's always appealed to me. I will say really quick for the audience though, the ping pong comment that Devin made, the first thing I thought of Devin, tell me if you remember this, right? Going to spin last year before the world turned upside down, right? We were at, I am Phenom. We went to this place called spin and you walk in and there are, there are like 40 ping pong tables. As far as you can see, there are big buckets of balls and everyone just picks up, starts playing. And it was the most fun event I've been to in forever. And it also set a really high bar for anything I go back to. I'm like, I don't want to just go back to and sit somewhere. I want to go and do something. So congrats to you and Phenom for like planting that seed in my head where I always am going to be anchored by that. Thank you. Yes. We've also set the bar exceptionally high for our marketing team now, because now we have to top that. I know uh, the first, uh, um, I am, uh, I am Phenom. I think we did bowling. Now we did ping pong. I don't know what's next, Ben. Uh, we may have tennis to, to rent out. We may have to rent out Lincoln Financial Field and do flag football. Whatever the case may be, we've certainly set up a challenge for here at Phenom. Uh, John uh, remembers those memories as well and says, yes, Ben. Um, so now that we've got uh, the Olympic conversation out of the way, Ben, I have to ask you, uh, HR isn't always something that individuals grow up and want to be. If you were to ask your six-year-old son today what he <laughs> wants to be when he grows up, it may not be in human resources. So how did you get into this field and, and what exactly are you doing now? So goodness, I started out in HR years ago working as a practitioner. And I, what's so fun for me is the funny part of that I tell everyone is that I knew I wanted to be in HR when I was a kid. I didn't know what it was called. So I'm the older middle child of four boys. And it was, I never had the position authority of being the oldest. So it was always like brokering deals, getting people to do things they didn't want to do, trying to bring a you know, peacemaker. So like all those skills helped me when I got into HR. But the real answer is when I've worked for really small businesses and smaller companies as I was going through high school and college. And I kept meeting these, these leaders who are like, I don't know how to hire the right people. I don't know how to keep them. I'm not sure what it's going to take to develop them. And I thought, I'll just figure out how to solve that stuff. And then I'll always have a job. I was super nerdy then and I'm super nerdy now. So just a warning and found out when I was in college, there's this thing called human resource management. Like that, that sounds kind of boring. Someone made me write a paper on it. As I started digging into it, I realized it was exactly what I always wanted to do. So I worked in HR for years, loved it so much fun. The only thing I loved a little more was the research side, which is what I get to do now. So mm -hmm. I spend my time now doing two kinds of research. One on the technology side, I look at the tools that companies are using to hire to engage, to retain, to develop their people, trying to understand what's out there, what capabilities are there. I've written a book on that called Artificial Intelligence for HR, in which I give a, a, a hat tip to the Phenom team for the great work they're doing. On the, the other side of the research, though, is around practices, trends, what are companies doing to try to stand out from the crowd, what are the high performers doing that we can all learn from. So it's so much fun to, to be able to see you know, ask the questions, the things I'm curious about, and to see the data come in and help us to figure out what answers are there that we can hopefully stop doing the things we shouldn't be, start doing the things we should be, all those kind of things. So it's a, it's a ton of fun. I really enjoy it. Yeah. I, I, I love that, that brokering deals and being the peacemaker. I think that human resources may have a bad PR agent because when I think to popular shows like The Office, Toby kind of gives HR a little bit of a bad name in that show. Uh, so we we have to work on that with Hollywood and, and the powers that be. But Ben, you mentioned research and how much you enjoy digging into it and finding answers. So I have to ask you, with these terrifying names that are floating out there, like the Great Exodus, the Tsunami Turnover, things that would keep me up at night if they were childhood stories that I was read to uh, when I was little, um, employee experience is changing for a lot of organizations. So based on your research and your conversations, what trends are you seeing uh, when it comes to this, this Great Exodus? Oh, goodness. So one of the things I've, I've told, a, I told a friend recently, when you know an HR conversation makes into the main, like the headline news, it's well, that's wild. That's crazy because that never happens. You know, our stuff always happens kind of in the back room, in the back office, and we just, we get our work done quietly. But when people are talking about the great resignation and suddenly this is the, in the headlines and everyone's 
on everyone's lips. Even you know, family asks me like, hey, what's this thing I hear about? Because you're the HR person in the family, right? And you probably have that. Like, hey, you're the recruiter. Look at my resume. Well, you're the HR person. What's this stuff about? And essentially what I'm hearing from our research advisory council made up of employer, employer leaders that, that represent you know, millions of employees, they're talking about we are – people are – if they're being forced to come back to the office, they're leaving, they're planning on leaving, they're looking for and have a higher threshold for the things they expect from us as an employer in that relationship. And in some, in some cases, I mean, this, I think this is a positive thing. It hurts, it hurts, change hurts always, but long-term it's going to encourage employers to really see people and value people as individuals and care about them. Last year, when the world turned upside down, one of the first things employers had to do was, was realize they had been making a lot of assumptions about their people. When Devin shows up in the office and he's smiling, we assume he's healthy, his family is safe. Like we assume all these things about him just because we see you. And suddenly when companies lost that ability to see what was going on, they realized, wait a minute, we don't know any of those things. We were just making guesses. And so now they're having to really treat them as individuals, as humans, which seems strange, but human resources. And so that's the the big picture of this. This is kind of the culmination of everything that's been happening over time. Someone, I asked her yesterday about this, a CHRO, and she said, it's time to face the music. Like this is something we almost brought on ourselves as employers because we haven't paid enough attention to the people and what they need from us. So it'll be wild to see how this plays out. Yeah, Ben, it's it's interesting what you bring up there that we we see people on a, a daily basis. And then when we leave, we, we kind of figure out we don't know what's going on. And the first thing that pops into my mind, I'm back in the office right now. We have a fantastic studio set up. But when I first came back, we had plants scattered throughout the office and the plants were dead, right? Because no one was here to water them. Um, and I know that's kind of a silly analogy when we're talking about some of these serious topics. But at the end of the day, that was something where we came in, someone was in charge of taking care of the plants, making sure that they were green, getting plenty of sunlight, and then everyone left. And that's kind of the same thing with human resources and what happened with employees. And you mentioned that it's making mainstream news and it has been for the past year for multiple mm -hmm. different reasons. I know right now um, wages are in the news, but when we take a look at you know, the uh, social injustices that were happening last summer, DE&I was a huge aspect, embracing empathy, uh, interacting with candidates and employees at the same time to showcase what your company truly stands for, uh, as well as adapting to new communication styles. Uh, when people would come into the office for interviews or whatever it may be, it was easy to have a conversation and say, hey, look at how great our company culture is. We have a ping pong table back here. Uh, we have a snack wall, all of these things. Like those were great selling points. But when you remove the office in that home environment for organizations, you really have to take a look inside. So what do you think has been the biggest challenge for HR teams? Is it DE&I? Is it showcasing that company culture in a remote world? I know it's a bit of a loaded question because they all are, but has one stood out more than the other? So goodness, I could, we could spend a lot of time just, just diving into the different options there. Um, one of those DEIs, it's a big conversation. It's a big, big discussion. And some of the things you talked about there, I had a chance a few months ago to talk to the head of DEI for Takeda Pharmaceuticals, massive, massive organization. And she was telling me that one of the things that they actually positioned themselves as internally in the last year, she said, we're always the, the in charge of diversity hiring and, and things like that. That's always on our minds. But we had other people coming to us from supply chain, from marketing, from other areas of business saying, hey, you're the diversity experts in the business. Can you help us figure out what we should be doing, how we should be approaching this, what's, what things should be on top of mind? And she actually said they got to the point where they're actually helping to influence the drug trials, right, that they're using in the, in the company, that they're using to serve their, their, their ultimate patients by saying, do we have this representative sample of diverse individuals going through these things? So they became the, not just a, hey, Diversity is important. We need to make sure we're hiring them. But how can we plug this perspective in where we are an organization that really cares about every single person in every layer of the business? So I've seen lots of examples like that where we're, we're bringing that to the forefront and that's becoming a, a really high priority for employers. We have some really interesting data on how companies are actually trying to solve for that because you and I both know one of the big headlines in the news in addition to all the other stuff we're talking about is around you know, things like AI and bias. And people are worried, like all these tools are going to you know, be biased and actually harm our diverse candidates. And so we, in our research this year, asked a question around how are you balancing automation and AI and how are you hiring more quickly, trying to be really effective and efficient with fairness? 
how do we balance those two things? Because they seem like they're at odds with each other. And so employers were, were talking about things like we're using assessments and tools to help make sure we, we grade everybody fairly, or we're making sure that in the process, we're going through and doing some analytics after the, after the fact and saying at this stage of the funnel, we had 20% diversity candidates. At this stage, we had 2% diversity candidates. What happened in the middle there? What happened in that stage that's filtering them out? And how can we actually take action to solve for that? So we've seen some companies really trying to really go active. It's not just saying we're going to source more diverse individuals or just do more, you know, initiatives, but how do we make sure throughout the process we're balancing those things because they want to, companies really want to do the good job. Not a single person wakes up and says, we want to make sure and, and be a, <laughs> be a challenge, be a blocker, be a roadblock for any diverse candidates that apply for us. Oh, no, that does it on purpose. But occasionally there are things that are systemic in the process or there's a, there's a stage in there or something else that ends up leading to those outcomes. So I, I plunged all in on DEI for that conversation right there, but we can talk about mobility and some of the other things probably top of mind for you and for the other people in the audience, because those are also some things I'm super passionate about and have some good data on as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you have any questions for Ben, please feel free to drop them into the comment section. But Ben, one thing that you had mentioned there that, that really jumped out at me was uh, we're looking at all of these large amounts of data. And you said mm -hmm. no company uh, really wants to uh, exclude any individuals. And I always think of that almost cliche of you're not just a number on a piece of paper. You know, you're not just a, a cog in this machine. Um, but when we talk about these large data initiatives and every company is looking at it, when we look at the Netflixes of the world, the Amazons of the world, and how that's kind of trickling into everyday organizations where people are starting to look at numbers for hiring and for, you know, the, the best hire that they can get. Obviously, that is a key ingredient to that and informs them on ways to achieve success. But if an organization is looking at all of these different metrics, how do they know that they're looking at the right ones at the end of the day? Um, mm -hmm. I know from my experience as a recruiter, it was always very focused on output, right? How many calls are you making? How many emails are you sending? And that infuriates me to some extent, because I know it's part of the, the the job and part of the process. But at the end of the day, if you have three fantastic conversations and two of them are hires, that's going to look better on your resume. And I know it's a numbers game. It's a funnel and everything mm. like that. But from an organizational perspective, how do you look at the right data to ensure success? Very mm. long winded question. I apologize. <laughs> But I'll give that's, over to you. That's all right. So how do we look at the right data? I would encourage everyone out there, like if you asked the audience right now, like what is one of the metrics that you're required to report on as a recruiting leader, as a recruiting practitioner? And one of the most common ones is time to fill, right? And I'm actually doing a session later today talking about all the reasons why that's the metric we should not be prioritizing. Can you use that generally as just a benchmark? Yes, but that shouldn't be the end all be all of what we're measuring because if we're filling jobs really, really quickly with the wrong people, guess what? You're just really, really efficient at doing the wrong thing. So let's not, let's not prioritize that. Um, other areas of other areas of the data where we can measure things. I have a very good friend who's the, the head of town acquisition at a 70,000 person organization. And he, his favorite thing to measure is quick quits, QQs, right? How quickly are people leaving after they join us? If they're leaving 30 days later, we screwed up something likely in the recruiting process. We targeted the wrong person. We didn't share it the right way. We didn't communicate what the role was going to be like, or the hiring manager has a, some culpability in that as well. But looking at those things, that's a measure of quality of hire, essentially. And what's really intriguing is a couple of years ago, the very first study we ever did at Lighthouse was around metrics and data and measurement in the TA function. And we asked, and overwhelmingly, the number one thing company said was the biggest priority was quality of hire. But inevitably, we'd get them on the phone to a, do a follow-up interview and like, tell us more about this. What are you using? How are you approaching that? And it was like, uh, do you have any ideas on how we can do it? Like they know it's important, but when it comes to actually doing it, it's one of those things that feels like this, this hard, hard uh, hurdle to overcome. It's like, how do we actually measure those things? So one way we do that, that we, we, we advise is looking at the quick quit rate, um, looking at other pieces of the process and the throughput there. I gave an example of using, looking at, after a job closes, looking at where your diverse candidates went through, if that's a if that's a really big priority for your organization. So really, I actually saw this starting last year, very, very early last year. We had finished some gathering some data and we saw this little bit of a shift from 
the year before, like the biggest thing was experience, candidate experience. We got to make sure that's perfect. And we saw the shift over towards diversity retention as a big, as bigger priorities relative to that, because companies realize we can make this really great and just shove people through the funnel. But if we're not shoving the right people through the funnel, then at the end of the day, we're just making our job harder for ourselves. If we're having to refill these jobs and rehire for them again. And oh, goodness, none of us, right? You've been there. You've been a recruiter. When someone <laughs> says, hey, that person you poured all that blood, sweat, effort into the late night calls and texts and negotiating the salary, they left six weeks after they came here. That's like a kick in the gut. That hurts. And so you don't want those kind of things. And that's why we're, we're like, let's get away from some of those older measurements and get into some of those better ways of looking at the data. Yeah, it's it reminds me of I, I grew up in a, in a in a small town in New Jersey, and it's like when that new restaurant comes to town, right? Uh, and there's a wait uh, a line out the door. No one can get food. There's reservations that are booked up for a week. But when you look at the overall success of that restaurant, it is. Um, are people coming a year from now? Are they coming two years from now? It has, you know, the organization or, or the restaurant change where the people are, they're still making food that people like. And when you think of that from your company perspective is, yeah, it's great to have a fantastic candidate experience. I think everyone says that is necessary in order to get people in the door. But when it comes down to it, if they're not staying there for a, a long time, um, you know, quick quits as it's, as you mentioned before, that's a real issue. And Lisa chimes in, in the chat and says, what is your benchmark time frame for quick yes. quick? So is it 60 days, 90 days a year? What, what does that look like? That's a great question, Lisa. And thank you for that. So it really depends. I feel like an attorney, right? It depends <laughs> on your organization. Um, if you're working for a manufacturing company or you're working years ago, I worked for a, a, an organization, nonprofit, we did direct care for the developmentally disabled and the mentally ill. And so we worked with these, we had people that worked with them. It was low pay. It was a very tough job. If that person stayed for eight months, they were above average. So it was a really challenge, challenging role. So if I got them to stay for a year, I called that a win. I was so excited and so proud of that. So whatever your, your rate is for your organization, look at that. If you have a long tenure, then it's going to be a little bit longer. It'll be, you know, if they're leaving in nine months, it's not be a big, a big deal. But if you have a really high turnover, that's just rapid and your retail and, and things like that, then someone staying for three weeks, you know, probably is going to be an example of the quick quit. So there's a range there for sure, depending on your organization. And it really, it depends on industry and some of the other kind of factors. That's a great question, Lisa. And thank you for asking that clarification. Cause I want to make sure like, if I said six months, some of you would laugh in my face because people don't stay six months in the typical role at your company. And for our others, it's well, six months, you know, our average 10 years, four years. Like that's, that's crazy. So there you go. A, another question on that is how important are, are exit interviews in that process? Even if it's just for a day, somebody comes into the, the company and says, Hey, you know, this isn't for me. I, one day mm -hmm. I'm leaving. Uh, you should always follow up on those, correct? And get as much information. Um, and if you're not able to have exit interviews, what's a good benchmark, you know, with all of the employees that leave, what's a good benchmark to look at and, and maybe get some, some trends as well as centralizing all of that information. Cause if you have, one department doing exit interviews in you know one state and another doing others. How can you really get all of that information together to improve your process and have employees for the long term? Well, you said bring your bring the data together, and that's actually the yeah. biggest problem I see with exit interviews is they happen somewhere, and then that's written down on a sheet of paper and it's filed away somewhere and it's never seen again. No one ever says, "Let's look at these in aggregate and figure out what's going on." So I I definitely believe in the value of having an exit interview, especially if someone's leaving quickly. You know, so in some of those roles, someone just doesn't show up and eventually, like, okay, well, I guess they're never coming back and we're done. But if you have the ability to get in touch with them and just find out, hey, what what happened? Was there a mismatch between what we told you and what you what you actually saw? Um, did you think it was going to be easier? Or did your, was your manager the problem? Like, help us understand what this is so you can know what to do about that. Rolling that data up is powerful. So uh, there's a the company I mentioned a minute ago, when I was working as an, as an HR leader there, we had wild amounts of turnover. And if I went to anybody on the HR team, even some of our executive leaders, I could say, hey, you know what our turnover is? Absolutely. It's above 50% a year. And it's just one of those things that everybody knew. But I said, but who who are those people? Yeah. I don't know. And so I actually went through, spent two weeks gathering all these old employee files and the, from the dusty filing cabinets, right? And working through every single one of them, plugging them into a spreadsheet over the course of two weeks. And I had this, this list of five years of turnover termination data or turnover data to figure out when were they leaving, how long had they been there, what were the reasons for leaving if we had that. And what I found was 
of those 50% a year, on average, about half of those were leaving in the first month or two. So again, quick quits. I saw I was able to identify this very quickly. What I also did was looked at that by, by manager though, by region, by different departments. And I found that we had a manager over here. I have no idea what he was doing. I had no idea at the time, but his turnover was at 10% a year. And then we had other, so that meant that 50%, Everybody else is pulling it the other direction, right? Statistically. So he was holding the average down to 50% with whatever he was doing over here. And everyone else was pulling it the other way. So those kinds of things allowed me to get into the data and actually see what was going on. That wasn't actually interview information, but it allowed me to use some of the information around why and when they were turning over to get some better clarity there. Because if you just say 50%, like, well, it just is what it is. But if I said, hey, half of that is happening in the first couple of months, like, okay, let's figure out how we can change this process in the interviews or change how we're doing this, or we'll give them some exposure before they start. They're going to come do a, do a ride along, you know, on a shift with someone yeah. or whatever we got to do to reduce those things. It gives you some, some ways to take action on it. And the, the problem with data is when it's this really big thing, this aggregate, we don't know what to do. It's hard to do anything about it. But when we start really honing in and narrowing that down, that focus, we can start trying some things to impact that and really lead to better outcomes. And you mentioned the the outlier of the manager that only had a 10% turnover. You can get some insights from that individual as well as what's working, right? Why are you so successful and everyone else is struggling with that? Are you doing something differently? And you mentioned looking at all the comments, um, you know, within exit interviews. And immediately I think of one of those word graphs, right? Where you throw them all into a spreadsheet and it says, oh, the issue may have been DE&I over here. It may have been career growth, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. But getting that information centralized has to definitely be important. Excuse me. Yes. Now, obviously, the conversation that this is leading into is around internal mobility, employee experience, and that next wave that you mentioned a little bit earlier. There's a ton of different approaches to it. I've seen things around gig work and having that organizational uh, across an entire organization so people can follow their passions and help out in other ways, really become assets to the company. But also, there's been a lot of talk around mentoring as well as career pathing. With all of these different options um, for employees, to really further themselves within a company, what has been the biggest trend when it comes to developing talent? Have you seen one outperform the other or do you in, do you see one becoming a bitter, bigger impact on the line? I definitely definitely think uh, ping pong tables are the answer here. <laughs> oh, goodness. No, so if I look back over the last five to 10 years, all the data we have, all the data from these other sources that are very reputable, Gallup and others, you see this thing come up over and over again, almost like, yeah, obviously, now we know to expect that because we've seen it so often. The biggest predictor of someone sticking around is if they feel like there is a, a path ahead for them. If they feel like there's a development path, some sort of growth opportunity, some way for them to continue developing and honing their skills over time. If they don't see that, they're not going to stick around. And so one of the things I always advocate, we have to enable our managers to do this because it's really hard for us to take this on ourselves as recruiting and HR leaders. So for those of you listening in, it's something that we need to enable our manage managers to do. And I'll give you a very simple tool to do that. We need to help the managers cast a vision for their people that shows them, here's what I, here's what I see you doing. Here's where I see you contributing. Here's the thing that I think you can do. What do you think about that? And let them help them to see what that path is. Because guess what? If you don't cast that vision and they can't do that by themselves, when that recruiter calls from the competition across the street, they will see that picture they're painting for them and they will want to go and participate in that. So if as a tool for the managers, it's very simple is when you're, when they're having a one-on-one, -on -one, they're having a conversation, reserve a few minutes at the end and say, this is, this time is yours, right? Devin, you own this time. We're having our one-on-one. -on -one. What can I do to help you achieve your career goals? Or what do you want to be? What do you want to do? Right? And just allowing that person to open into question, not a yes or no. Do you want to do something else? Yes or no. But what do you want to be? What do you want to do? How can I enable that? And sometimes there's not a really clear answer. Like, I'm not sure. Well, what are the things you like? And those things will start helping to steer that relationship. So if Devin says, you know what? I really want to get better at kind of forecasting and stuff. I like data, but I'm not sure how to do those things. Next time the manager is planning their, their budget forecast for the year, hey, Devin, come sit with me for 10 minutes. I want to show you how I do this. And those little things, that doesn't mean Devin's changing his job. That doesn't mean he's moving to a new role necessarily right away, but he's starting to hone those skills that excite him, that get him pumped up. There's so much data out there that back up this idea that we should be moving people inside the business. And for whatever reason, 
I'm guilty of this too. So I'll paint with a broad brush here. I'm, I'm guilty of this. But when we open a rec, we're like, yeah, I know that Bob is a really great fit for this, but he's got this one wart, this one issue that we're just not sure about. But I'm sure there's a perfect candidate out there somewhere that doesn't have any problems at all. Right. And we're, we always make that decision to look outside before we look inside that the data from Gallup says that the vast majority of positions are filled from people outside the business. And that demotivates our people and everything else. On top of that, though, I'll give you a couple of quick stats from different sources just to help you understand why I'm such a big advocate of this. Number one, data from I4CP says that when you have managers that kind of cling to their talent and they don't want them to move on and find other roles, they call them talent hoarders. And if organizations have a high concentration of talent hoarders, they perform worse in terms of customer acquisition, revenue, and profitability. The other data, uh, Wharton School of Business says that, actually, that's actually like in your neck of the woods, I think, Devin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Wharton's, Wharton School says that when you hire someone from outside the business, it costs you more, up to 20%, and they perform worse on average for the first two years they're on the job. So they're, you're paying more for lower performance when you're hiring outside on average. And the last but not least, some of our data at Lighthouse show that it's less risky to use someone internally and to try to move them around or try to find opportunities to grow their skills. And it's less costly. So there's all these things that kind of paint this picture that we shouldn't always default to that external look the first time we think about we need this thing. Oftentimes, it's right there close by. We might not have a clear picture of what those skills are or we haven't done a good job of helping people feel like they can speak up and say, hey, here's a skill I have. I want to do that. But those things really create that culture, that engagement that we are all like, trying to figure out where it is. It's right there in front of us. We just need to tap into it. No, and and one thing that I, I personally I don't know any in metrics around, but I, I imagine that they're out there some places. As we look at this almost hybrid remote world that we're in now, if you have an individual uh, swap departments, right? I, I'm came from sales. Now I'm in marketing. I have a great relationship with our sales team. I think they may not think the same thing, but uh, we'll <laughs> play along later. here. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Um, but it's that ability to say, hey, we really uh, want to get this insight from sales and somebody that can then raise their hand and say, hey, I'm very close with so-and-so over there. Let me reach out to them. Let me ask them a question. And it builds that community that you have uh, in the same sense of, you know, people hopping from kind of department to department, it's not a bad thing, right? And they can upskill and take what they've learned from previous roles and then apply it into their next role. Hootsuite actually has a program that does that exact thing. And their first person that tested it out did exactly what you did. They went sales marketing, or I can't remember if it was marketing, sales, sales marketing, but those are the two pieces that were intertwined. And they kept hearing people like, we want to grow, but that's, we're not we're not a huge company, right? We don't have 10,000 people. We have a couple hundred at the time. So how are we going to do this? So they started this thing where they have some like stretch assignments. So they'd take a, a Devin who was interested in contributing somewhere else and say, okay, for the next three months, one day a week, you're going to go and spend time over there. You're going to learn things. You're going to bring them some information and so on. But what was really powerful because that sometimes feels like it's just a, like a little vacation for somebody. You know, we're going to give you one day off a week to go and hang out with the other team. That's, that's too laid back. So they put some restrictions around it and said, if for the manager that's lending you out, they had to agree to lose you for one day a week. But they also said, when you come back, I want you to bring these things to us. On the flip side, the, the borrowing manager who is borrowing you for that period of time, they said, you're not just coming over to hang out. You're going to come and you're going to bring these insights that we don't have from your side of the business so that when we have a question, not only do we have that relationship with you, we can ask you, but we also will know Oh, that's how they make decisions. So we know how to tie back into that. And at the end of that three months, you decide, do you want to stay in that new role that you've, that you've been playing around in? Or do you go back and kind of consolidate your knowledge and figure out what your next steps are career-wise? But it allowed them to have some flexibility there. So I love your story because it ties in really well with, with how, they, how they worked on that. And I love their example because, again, like the idea of job rotation or moving someone to another role, that's been around forever. But it often, when someone says that, it often feels like, yeah, 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 but that doesn't work here because like, insert whatever. And the, they put some restrictions around it to make it very rigorous and formal. And not only do the managers appreciate that, but the employees love having a little bit of chance to steer their own ship. Yeah. And I, I love that idea because it also, it allows for, um, you know, the, the employee making the move to not put it in neutral for that last week before they switch <laughs> departments or whatever it may be. I'm sure that everyone has an example of somebody saying, oh, I'm moving over to this department. 
uh, I'm going to kind of take I'm it gonna, easy this <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But by setting those requirements around it, uh, it certainly prevents that. My, my next question for you, Ben, is it's great to talk about these stories, right? And have these conversations, me and you on the live stream, but are companies actually showcasing them? Are they only posting them on the career site? Are they showing them to internal employees and saying, hey, um, you know, Ben just moved from marketing into sales. Uh, you can do it too. Are they showing these stories as successes within the organization or is it kind of just behind closed doors as it stands right now? That's a really, really great question. I would say, number one, there are some companies that do it really well. I've, I've given you some examples. I can give you others of companies that really make this a priority and that when it happens, it's fanfare and excitement and reinforces the idea for every other person that if they want to move up, so people have no interest, right? They're happy where they are. But for those that want to move up, this is this path is available to you. Some companies do a great job of that. Others, again, I'll admit this, we're not always good at promoting and advertising and showcasing the great work that we're doing in HR and talent. We do something and we think everybody knows about it. And you go and talk to someone like, what is that? Like, I'm not even aware of those. That What's this thing you're talking about? So we don't always do a good job of marketing and sharing those stories. And I think you said like career site, right? We should be putting these things out, not just internally telling them what's going on. And if we have the next all hands, we'll congratulate this person for moving up to the next role. But also we should be showcasing that for our candidates in those conversations. That's one of the things I've actually been advocating in the last year. We're talking about this whole, we're talking to an audience broadly about town acquisition through the lens of development, right? And this idea that when you come here, we don't hire you and expect you to stay right here and be this valuable for the rest of the, you know, for the next 10 years. We want you to be this valuable over time. And here's how we're going to pour into you to make that possible. That is, that is a conversation every candidate is excited to hear and they want to hear. The data we have on how companies are actually approaching that though. A lot of companies say, well, it's kind of on that person. It's on the individual. They've got to speak up. They've got to take it all on their shoulders. And what we found in the data are those companies that are high performing, the ones that have better revenue and engagement and retention of their people. Those companies are much more likely to say, that not, that's not just on Ben or on Devin. That's on us broadly as a group of leaders, leadership exec, from an executive perspective. That's on us as HR and talent to make sure that we're putting the right processes in place. That's on managers to be asking the questions, like I mentioned earlier, what do you want to be? How can I enable that? And it's also on you as an individual to, to speak up and say, I want to develop this thing right through a gig, or I want to go in that direction career-wise and help me plot my path in that direction. It's on all of us equally. We have some responsibility for that. But again, the low performing companies are more likely to say, you know, figure it out over there. You, it's all on your shoulders. You can, you can handle that. And that's not, we should never let that be how we just you know sit back and relax and assume that's how it's going to be. Yeah, no, it, it's an interesting point to where organizations put the onus on the employee to, to almost raise their hand and say, I don't want to do this anymore. Right. And yes. that's a challenging spot for anyone to be in, to say, it, it's almost like a breakup in that sense where it's, I'm looking to go elsewhere. And a lot of organizations view it as a red flag, right? Like, uh, they're, they're no longer invested, right? When mm -hmm. they should be looking at is they're invested so much in our company and what we're doing here that they want to continue to do it just in a different way. Mm -hmm. So when you have to look at it from that perspective, it almost requires a culture change, right? Where um, across the organization, you have to encourage some of those conversations that you mentioned previously. How can organizations do that effectively since we've seen so many challenges with changes in cultures that have we've shed light on this this past year, right? Where organizations are struggling with remote work. They're struggling with mm -hmm. DE&I. This is another aspect that low performing organizations could be struggling with. How do they change that culture effectively? Okay, I'm gonna give you two different examples, yeah. okay? okay? The first one, first was, cause you mentioned the remote thing. I wanna make sure I talk about companies that are and that aren't because there's people listening in probably yeah. that represent both of those audiences. So the first one is Tata Consultancy Services. Major, major, outsourcing company, uh, professional services organization, technical, they have a little bit of everything there, that hundreds of thousands of employees, mass organization. When you start there, the first thing they plant in you as an expectation is when you are meeting with your manager, your manager is going to say, what do you want to do next? What do you want to do next? And for some of us, when you're, you know, first day on the job, it's like, nah, just shut up and do your job. But the first conversation you have with your manager there, it's what do you want to do next? They're always looking forward. And one of the things that's, incredible with their story. This isn't just a, 
oh, that's a, that's, that's fun. And you know, that's a soft measure or whatever else their CEO, their CTO and their CFO, arguably the three most you know, influential individuals in the entire organization started as trainees at the company. And they followed that path of what do you want to be next? What do you want to be next? What do you want to be next? All the way up to the highest levels of leadership in the organization. So that's a, again, that's why I believe in that so strongly because it's something very simple and yet super powerful. If you can get that embedded and ingrained in your managers to be asking that on a regular basis. The other example I want to point to you is um, Chipotle restaurants. So one of the things that they do years ago, they realized they had this terrible issue of turnover in their store managers. It was just churn and churn and churn. And when you, you lose the person that, you know, scoops the guacamole, right? We can train someone else to do that. When you lose the person that manages the training, manages the schedules, manages the inventory, manages customer service, suddenly you realize how much that costs you as an organization. So they made a decision like from this point forward, we're never going to do this thing again. And that thing was hire a store manager from outside the business. From then on, it was, we were always promote someone from within to take over one of these roles because they realized they stuck around longer and they performed better. And so not only did they make that a priority, so when you come there, that's a possible path for you if you want to go in that direction. Not only did they do that though, but they also put some things structurally in place to influence and support that. So if you ever worked for a leader probably that is really good at recognizing your strengths and giving you feedback and making sure that you are, they're, they're helping you figure out what your path is, those, those leaders that are excellent at that, those leaders get a bonus at Chipotle for helping someone grow into one of those spots. So they, they really are, are playing the role of coach and guidance and mentor to bring those people up. And it's not just a thing, we expect you to do that because you work here and that's extra work and, you know, make it fit, yeah. but we're actually going to pay you to do that and make that an incentive so that you spend your time growing those leaders up for those people that already have that kind of skill set. So a couple different examples there of different levers we can pull to try to drive those outcomes. Cause I completely agree with you. This is a, this is a really big deal. And if we can solve for this, this is, you know, in all the data, this is the biggest predictor of whether someone's going to stick around. Is it the only thing? No, but in our research, we, we asked, have you ever left a job? We asked the workforce, have you ever left a job because you didn't see a path ahead? And 70, 80, 90% of them said yes, right? Depending on the year, up to 90% of them say yes. Mm -hmm. But 88% said, I would have stayed if I saw a path ahead. Yeah. No, and I'm, I'm happy that you brought up Chipotle because it's an example that we use regularly. They were in the news uh, as of late um, that they uh, promised that employees who are with their organization for three plus years will make over $100,000 a year, which for a, a quasi fast food chain, right? That's a huge statement, but based on what you said about their culture and how they're only promoting within, it makes sense. And also I'm sure that they don't kind of kick people on their, their way out the door. If they do decide to pursue a new career or do further their education or whatever it may be, they, they form that bond. So that is an awesome thing to hear that that claim that they are making doesn't just start from we're going to try and tackle this $15 minimum wage thing and, and blow it out of the water by saying everyone can make six figures. So it's, it's awesome to hear that. But my question for you is, as we talk about through a, a lot of different topics today, um, the future is still coming, right? And we still have to improve upon the things that we talked about today, but down the line, what do you foresee organizations struggling with in the future and what could potential solutions be with, within that? Oh my Lord. That's a great know, question. It's a and huge question. Save the best for last, right? <laughs> what possibly could happen in the future? Um, yeah. Alien attack. Would... <laughs> oh goodness. There are so many different potential changes and landmines and things that employers could run into. One of the things that, that I've seen of late is we talked, we started with data. I'll probably come back to that, I guess for now. One of the things that I've seen is organizations are increasingly saying we can no longer just make decisions based on what we think in the moments or based on what's the, the biggest fire to put out right now. We've got to actually have data to help us think about what's what's coming, what's next. We often have we're sitting on enough that we can start to make some good and accurate predictions, but we don't always use that. And again, I'll, I'll, I've been guilty of this. I've done this the wrong way. I've gone and said, hey, I think this is the right thing to do or I feel like this or and we're like, no, no. Why don't we just point to the evidence that's so much more powerful that's we're more likely to build a real coalition around us for this vision we're casting for the future of the organization they want to be involved in that our other leaders in the business they want to be on the winning team right they want to understand what's coming and if we can use some of the talent data we have to start predicting that that's really powerful um obviously i'm a, the, a big fan of the ai conversation and how that can add value to the work we're doing my perspective on that by the way is not that ai should be doing all the things that we do or should be taking away 
the things that make us human that actually emphasize and accentuate the human characteristics that we have. You mentioned empathy very early in the conversation. Those things are things an AI, an algorithm cannot do. And so the amazing tools that are out there, right? Phenom won an award for, for their program or for their platform this year because of the things it's doing around AI. That's incredibly powerful. But it, the real value in that isn't the thing that it automates. It's that it points the time back to Ben gets to spend more time interacting with candidates and building deeper relationships, right? I get to spend more time being a real um, consultative practitioner in the business, supporting the business strategic initiatives instead of just being, hey, we need, we need this job filled. It's a different relationship. And I think that's the real value of some of those things. Being better at data, our research shows you're more likely to be this leading practitioner than just uh, someone following behind saying, hey, no, no, listen to me. I've got an idea. They want to come to you. They want to, they want you to be in the conversations when you're using data to tell your stories because they're excited about the other stories, the, the problems they have that you can help them to solve with the data that we we have our fingers into as, as talent leaders. So that's the big thing I'd say is I don't know exactly what's coming, right? We can make all kinds <laughs> well, of guesses, but the data is going to help us prepare for that. Yeah. You said it. Aliens are coming. Um, but no, <laughs> you're, you're absolutely King Kong right. plague aliens. That's my best guess. <laughs> um, the, uh, the other thing that I, I wanted to call out there that you mentioned is, is keeping the human aspect in human resources, right? There's a reason why human is in the title and it is not just hiring or whatever it may be. And then mm -hmm. by automating certain things that give time back in the day, it turns talent acquisition into talent advisors in that sense, where they can have genuine conversations, human conversations and say, answer some of those questions that you asked earlier. What do you want to do in the future? Uh, what other passions do you have outside of this? Rather than, uh, it looks like you have three years of experience here. You have a bachelor's degree. You have you know experience within the field. You can begin to build some of those relationships where we talk about it all the time on the program, silver medalists and other individuals who may have applied for roles that they weren't quite qualified for yet. You can then follow back without having burnt that bridge and say, we loved you as a person. We don't think you'd be right for this role, but we'd love to bring you back for that. And I want to call out, I know um, Justin Devitt behind the screen, behind the scenes flashed up on the screen, but JD, friend of the show says, so critical to show a path ahead for a fresher or even someone with 20 years of experience as a professional. And I think that's important as well, is when we think about career pathing and the journey in the future for the talent we're bringing in the, in the door, Oftentimes it's around entry level positions, right? It's where are you going from here? When as someone with, you know, 10, 15, 20 years of experience, like JD says here, they could still want a path as well that differs from your traditional ladder. So I did want to want to call that out as well. I don't know if you have anything to add to it, but um, I'll, I'll hand the floor back over to you. Just to reiterate that piece there um, really quick, the, the Takeda example I gave earlier, mm -hmm. they're they're this recruiting leader there that was kind of leading the charge there. Her name was Dominique. And Dominique has now stepped into the role of the head of DEI for North America for Takeda because that was the past, she, like that was not on anyone's org chart. That wasn't on in the books you read in high school that say, here's the career you're going to go to. It wasn't in any of those things. But she realized as she had been working, those things that really revved her up and got her excited and passionate about coming to work. Those things were where she wanted to spend her time. And she was able to work with her organization to find a way to, to slot that in. One last, if you don't mind, like I love stories, mm -hmm. obviously, but one last funny story. I know you mentioned to me that you have a, a new one coming, new little one to come into your, your family very soon. Congratulations on that, by the way. I want Thank to you. mention Thank that you. here. I'll tell you the thing not to do really quick. And it's my story about why we need to be data driven, but people oriented. So years ago we were, driving to the hospital at 800 miles an hour. I had to get my wife there because we were about to have a baby and mm -hmm. I'm freaked out. She's freaked out. We get there and they set her up on this monitor that's measuring the strength of her contractions. And I'm the data guy. So I'm here watching the readout on the screen every time it's, you know, and uh, I hear behind me, she says, Ooh, that was kind of rough. That was a painful one. And I said, well, you know, on the screen, it didn't look like it was actually that bad, you know? Okay. Terrible thing to say, but it's a reminder for me. And I tell that story, not just to, to laugh at myself, but because every data point that we're looking at, you mentioned silver medalists a minute ago, every data point we're looking at is a person, is a family, someone's hopes, dreams, their career, all those things are wrapped up. And it's so easy to sometimes distance ourselves from that just in the transactional day to day. And I encourage everybody, right? We need to be data, data oriented, but really keep the people element there because otherwise, right? We could be in supply chain or we can be in any other industry that doesn't really care 
this about the talent side of things. That's not a priority there. This is a differentiator for us. That's our secret weapon is because we care about the people. I don't ever, ever want to lose that. I, I love that sentiment and I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I, I, I'm glad to hear that your the relationship between you and your wife has gotten better since you said, well, it didn't really look that bad. So bravo there. Um, ben, I know you're you're doing a, a ton of stuff. You you mentioned the book, uh, summer school is going on. You mentioned you're speaking later today. I, I want to give the floor over to you. Where can people access more information from Ben Eubanks and the wealth of information that you provide? Well, thank you so much, number one, for the opportunity to share, to, to just chat with you about these things. It was so much fun for me. And it's always a joy to kind of talk about the stories, talk about the research and bring those to life for people, right? I don't want to be the, the static and dusty researcher. I want to bring these things in a way that we can take action on them. So I appreciate the opportunity, Devin, and the rest of the, the team behind yeah. Town Experience Live, right? Um, the website, Lighthouse Research and Advisory, lhra.io is the website. Um, ping me on LinkedIn, connect me there. I, that's where I live most days, right? Connected there. Um, I run a lot of events. I've Working on just turning the second edition of the book, right? If I look relieved and smiling extra today, it's because I just turned in the second manuscript and I'm relieved at having that off of my plate for the moment. And so I, I get to do a lot of things. And if you enjoy the conversation, the book is really an extension of, of this stuff today. It's called AI for HR, but it's really about making work more human by allowing us to focus on things that really, really matter and really connect with people. So thank you again for the opportunity. I appreciate everybody else for hanging out with us today. Thank you, Ben. I wish you nothing but the best. And hopefully we can get you on here soon uh, after the book is published and it's all out and we can we can dive back into the conversation if that works for you. That'd be a ton of fun. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I, I wish you the best. We'll talk to you soon. That was Ben Eubanks, Principal Analyst and Chief Research Officer at Lighthouse Research and Advisory. Uh, it was a candid conversation, just like the title said. Um, we talked a lot about employee experience, but that wasn't all. Uh, we dove into DE&I and everything else uh, that has been a hot topic. The tsunami turnover, the great resignation, how to uh, really infiltrate career pathing and, and run a successful human resources, as well as business as, as a whole. So if you missed any of it, feel free to catch the replay uh, either here on LinkedIn, on YouTube, or on the Phenom blog. It's www.phenom.com backslash blog. Uh, before we go, I do want to chat a little bit about our episode last week. Uh, I was joined by Amit Parmar here in studio. He's CEO and founder of Clickify. We talked everything around job descriptions. And I've mentioned on the show a thousand times, I used to be a recruiter and I was a huge proponent of the copy and paste. And that is probably why I am no longer a recruiter. Uh, but he talks a little bit about some of the downfalls of that and also what's wrong with job descriptions in this episode. But here is a quick clip of that. You know, look, the HR function continues to be inundated with so many requests, right? And, and you know, you've got budget pressures everywhere. So what happens is uh, often you'll get job descriptions that are stuck in a folder somewhere. Uh, maybe one that was written like two years ago for the same position. And it's, you know, it's, yeah. it happens because you're so busy. All you want to do is get this rec posted ASAP. Yep. Right. Uh, and, and that's what typically happens is you, you get something, you start off with something that was five years old, two years old, in some cases, even 10 years old. Right. And you maybe tweak it a little bit, mm -hmm. given the time constraints that you have as, as a recruiter or, or a talent or an HR leader uh, or even a hiring manager for that matter. Yeah. And, and that's what happens. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it is in my experience, I think the the way jobs are are posted and advertised uh, is a very underestimated step in the process. Definitely check out that full episode. We talk about uh, job postings on social media, TikTok, LinkedIn, as well as Facebook and Instagram. So definitely check it out. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Ben for joining today. He also hopped in the comments section how he could be two places at once. I have no idea, but shout out to everyone else who was in the comment section today. Uh, I saw Christina, John, Jennifer, Mark, Caitlin, Dan, and Kerr, Tom, uh, JD, Philippa, Lisa, thank you so much for making this possible. Uh, it was an awesome conversation with Ben. Again, uh, I said it before, if you missed any of it, uh, definitely check it out on YouTube. This episode is a must watch. And with that being said, I hope everyone has a fantastic weekend and I will see you next Thursday, noon Eastern time. Thanks again.